Hi. So this is the first time that we've run a live Q&A session um, for Avon Valley practice and it's a little bit uh, one of those things of a leap of faith to hope that actually this is going to work OK. So please bear with us um, if there's a technical hitch, if things don't flow quite as well as perhaps they should. Now, I do have another person with me, the producer, who is trying to make sure that the IT works. So if you see somebody behind me, please don't worry. Uh, he is wearing PPE um, and we are trying to maintain social distancing along with the rest of the population. So uh, we're going to kick off um, by just saying thank you to everybody. Welcome for coming this evening um, and taking the time to to make an effort to to be with us and to find out more about Avon Valley. And in particular, the um, hot topic is, of course, the COVID vaccine. So I'm Anna Morton. I'm the managing partner here and we have various different people also presenting with me. So first of all, we have Nina. She's our practice manager. OK, fabulous. Um, moving on, we also have Nick, who is our mental wellbeing worker. And hi, Nick. And there's also Claire. Claire. OK, now we'll present throughout this evening um, and you have a Q&A section. I can see that people have already started asking questions. That's brilliant. They will be published. Um, um, to everybody to see and if you do like that question then please do um, find, do like it so that we can see which questions we should answer first or in, in case we don't get to all of your questions but we will make every effort to do so. Um, any questions that are outstanding by the end of the evening we will endeavour to um, reply and make a response within the summary of our meeting that we'll share with all patients for those that cannot be with us tonight. Now um, just as I've been talking Dr Green has now joined us um, in terms of that. Oh there we are waving again. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay so Let's move on now. We're going to go in. I'm going to introduce Nina. She's going to talk about PharmaSelf. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about PharmaSelf. So last year you may remember that we spoke about raising funds for PharmaSelf, um, a machine that would benefit our community to enable you to collect your medication 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Before I update you on how far we've come with our project, I would like you to watch the following short video explaining farm shelf in that shell. that Farm South is a one-stop shop for you and in the fact that you can order your medication in a normal way and our dispensing team will dispense your medication and place a completed medication into the machine. You will, you will still receive a text in the normal way that you already do from us um, but you will receive a PIN code meaning that you can benefit from sharing this PIN code with somebody else if you want them to collect your medication for you. And, and feel secure that um, the pin code um, is a one-time use only. So you will go to the machine and you will enter the pin code at the dispensing machine and select the relevant 
exemption if you don't pay for your medication or by inserting your card into the machine. Um, your medication will then drop down um, from the machine and then you're ready to go. So I'm pleased to say that PharmaSelf is on its way and I wanted to share with you our entire journey. Um, so if you remember in 2000, it's September 2017, PharmaSelf was first pre presented to patients at our annual patient meeting. And as promised in 2019, October, we started crowdfunding, raising funds for two PharmaSelf machines. Very kindly, one of our patients Trish um, offered to hold a Easter raffle, raffle um, and very kindly contacted local businesses asking for prizes that could be donated for the raffle. Many businesses kindly donated some excellent prizes which you will see listed on our website. However, due to Covid hitting the country, the raffle couldn't take place, but we hope to rearrange this when we can. We have received donations from patients to the value of £10,256, which is awesome. And I just wanted to give a big, big thank you to all local businesses and a special thanks to Trish and to the patient that made a large one-off donation. In May 2020, due to the ongoing COVID situation, which I'll let Anna talk to you about later on, the practice for the need for improvement in the way patients collect medications as it has become challenging over the last few months. The practice made this decision to fund the shortfall for PharmaSelf in Durrington. However, we would still very much like to have a PharmaSelf unit at Uphaven and we will restart funding for this in December. So moving forward, in June of this year, we applied for planning permission for our Durrington site. And great news, our planning permission was granted in October. Farm self machine was ordered and the scope of works was agreed with the builders. November 2020 has been a busy month so far. Farm self has been dispatched from Italy and you may notice that the window um, in Durrington has closed over the last few days. This needed to happen um, so that works could be completed and for health and safety reasons. So thank you for your continued support um, during this time. Yesterday, the building works began at Durrington Sur Surgery, ready for the farm itself to be installed, which will be next Wednesday. Staff will be receiving training on the machine next Wednesday, and we will be sending out text messages to patients, um, letting you know when the machine will be ready, also updating our website. Nothing more to add there. So obviously the presentation was nice and clear. We're really, really looking forward to Farm Self um, being up and, and ready and established for everybody to use. Um, having access 24 seven to your collection of medications is absolutely imperative at the moment. Um, but how convenient is that? And hopefully it makes you know a, your days a little bit easier. So now I'm going to move on um, to uh, mental health. So I'd like to introduce Nick and Claire. Nick's going to speak first. Oh, hang on a minute. Sorry. We've just had a question in. OK, I'm going to read it um, aloud. One second. Let me just publish it for everybody to see. OK, so the question is, hi, how does the machine work if you have a prepaid certificate? Um, now, indeed, uh, that's a really good question. If you um, are exempt from uh, prescription charges, then actually when you go to receive your um, your medication. So as Nina explained, you'll order in the same way. It'll be ready. It'll be prepared by our dispensers as normally and put into a bag or well, actually into a box this time. And that box will go into the PharmaSelf unit. At that point, an SMS will be sent to you with a four digit code. Um, you can then attend the PharmaSelf unit at any time, day or night to collect that medication by putting that four digit pin into the machine and think of it like a cash machine. You'll put that four digit pin in, OK, and you'll be asked um, if you pay or if you are exempt. If you pay, then you will be asked to uh, provide your car payment details, very much like um, you do in terms of um, at a, a local cash machine or when you pay for services um, in the shops to be able to pay that charge of £9.15 per item. If, however, you are exempt 
OK, you will move into a nut. You will be directed to a different screen that will give you the options about the reason for your exemption. OK, you will tick the relevant exemption. OK, and then you will receive your medication without any charge and it will be dispensed accordingly. OK, so I hope that I've answered that OK uh, to be able to do that. Um, but again, any questions either now or at the end, please just do ask. Uh, moving back on to uh, mental health, sorry, and I'm going to just uh, move this through. So sorry, I pressed those, those buttons as I was uh, talking there. OK, is I'm going to pass over to uh, Nick in the first instance to start talking about mental health um, and then she'll pass on to Claire. OK, and then we'll have questions at the end. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm just going to go over a recap and introduction of mental wellbeing support workers. So this role is structured to support individuals suffering from low moods and anxiety in order to help prevent such situations from escalating further. The service is initiated via GP or nurse referral only and when appropriate patients will be invited to an appointment next. So in present time we have Claire who works part time and has supported 165 patients in the last 12 months, having undertaken 689 appointments, including 89 video consultations. We also have James, who joined 1st of April 2020 as a specialist mental health nurse to support patients with complex mental health concerns. He works part time and has supported 180 patients since 1st of April 2020, having undertaken 502 appointments. Nick, myself, I joined 1st of October also as a mental wellbeing support worker. So what is mental well-being? Mental health is defined as a state of well-being in which every individual realises his or her own potential, can cope with normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. Mental well-being is a goal for everyone. Health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Thank you. I'm just going to pass it over to Claire now. Sometimes you may find it hard to motivate others to do an activity, even the simplest ones. The mental health team at the surgery are here to support your needs and listen to all your concerns. If you feel you may need support, call the surgery and book an appointment with the mental wellbeing support worker and they can book you in. Last year we talked about mental health or mental wellbeing support workers and actually Claire was very much at the very beginning of her journey um, to undertake this role um, and hadn't actually started seeing patients and um, since then in terms of how many people she's seen is over 165 there have been numerous telephone calls face-to-face -face appointments video consultations which I know are, are new um, during the pandemic and of course Nick has now joined us because the demand for uh, mental well-being support, particularly during 2022, has increased day in and day out. And therefore, to ensure that we're still here for you and have the availability um, to be a point of access is that Nick has now joined the team um, to be able to um, support Claire and offer that those appointments to you. Now, sometimes it is appropriate that you can book directly with one of them, but quite often the case is, is that you'll see one of our GPs, one of our nurse practitioners, one of our practice nurses, um, etc., who can actually refer you on accordingly to make sure that, you know, they are the best people for you to see. Um, because again, we do recognise that mental health can be quite complex in many different ways, exactly the same as physical health, and therefore, you know, finding you the right person at the appropriate time is the most important thing to do. So, OK, and um, now since um, we've had we haven't had any questions about mental health, but we have had two more questions posed about um, the pharmaceutical unit. And I think it's probably just kind of relevant to, uh, to answer those questions now. So I'm going to ask uh, Nina to answer the first one. And the first question is, how are you going to sanitise the machine? We will we will sanitise the machine um, every day um, with um, our Tinel um, wipes. So the, key, the card machine where you um, enter your pin number will be sanitised by the staff throughout the day. OK, so in essence, there will be a daily cleaning. There, sorry, in essence, there will be a daily cleaning regime to ensure that actually that machine is kept safe. Of course, we will recommend that you use hand 
um, you know, you use the um, alcohol gel to make sure that uh, your hands are, are clean after that. But we do know that the medication going into those um, boxes are of exactly the same kind of level of uh, security as what they do if you were being collected the bag from from the window in Durrington or at the counter in Uphaven. Now there's another question posed as well um, and again this is over to you Nina is how secure is the medication? The, me the medication um, is is put into a secure individual box for each patient um, and that is that is the, in the inside of the building um, so it's very secure and on the outside of the building there is CCTV so it, any of the members of staff um, have access to um, the individual boxes for an individual's medication. The machine is completely secure. It's within the building. It's covered by CCTV. It's got the same security level as a cash ATM. Um, and therefore, you know, the risk of vandalism, sort of getting that information, uh, the um, the security the, the risk to that medication is very uh, are very minimal um, and they are secured within that unit um, and again the the same person has asked the question in terms of how COVID secure is it indeed the fact that it is outside whereby you don't need to come into the premises you don't need human contact to be able to collect your medication and indeed you can sanitize your hands before and after as well as us cleaning the machine um, on a regular basis um, is as COVID secure as we can make it. So I hope that I've answered those questions. I'm just now looking down to that. Ah, OK, so the next question, will I be able to collect my controlled drugs from the new locker type system? At the moment, um, we cannot we cannot put controlled drugs or fridge items into the machine, um, but that is a development quest request. So moving forward um, later on down the line, that, that might be an option that you can collect the medication from the machine. Until then, you would collect it in the normal way um, by coming to the surgery um, at Uphaven. Hi, thanks, Nina. OK, so I've just had a quick look down. I can't see any more um, questions about PharmaSelf at the moment, nor any about um, mental health. So we're now going to move on um, to the impact of COVID-19 on the practice. And um, it's been challenging for everybody, to say the least. Um, I don't expect to kind of cover all your um, questions and concerns about that and what's happened, um, but from the outset, what I'd like to reassure is that we have tried our very, very best. We don't declare we always get it right, um, but I think our intentions have always been sound, and I hope that that's what you have experienced whilst you have been in contact with us. So I put together this slide to show the level of activity that has been going on um, actually from the 1st of April to the 31st of October. And, I, you know, I could have started it, I admit that, from the 23rd of March, but I kind of thought actually it's easier to kind of um, get the activity and the summaries in, in kind of set months. Now, unfortunately, as you would have heard in many, many newspapers about how GP practices have closed, there haven't been any face to face appointments. Now, that may be the case around the country. I can't comment on that, but I can give you information about what we've done at Avon Valley Practice. So to reassure you, we have delivered um, over 12,000 face-to-face -face appointments. Now put that into context that we have seven and a half thousand patients registered with us. That means every person has had on average at least one appointment. OK, so we have been here for people to be able to do that. Now, is it as many as we had the year before? No, it's not. OK, we can't deny that there aren't as many face-to-face -face appointments. However, our telephone appointments, OK, and our video consultations, which are very much smaller, OK, have lit have taken off and our telephone appointments have been um, basically quadrupled in this in this period to what it was um, in the previous year. And that's because the national directive is that we need to speak with you about your healthcare needs before we just book you an appointment. And that is to ensure that only people that need a face to face appointment come to the surgery, because as much as, um, you know, 
we have to keep our workforce safe. Actually, the most important thing is to keep you safe. And we don't want to put you into any higher level of risk than what we absolutely must do. And that risk of your healthcare balance of what's needed between COVID and your other healthcare requirements is a, is a fine line. We admit that. And it's one that you can work with the GP or your uh, nurse practitioner, practice nurse, etc., about how to achieve that. So we want to reassure you that we have been here. We have answered numerous calls. Um, I understand it can be challenging. And indeed, there was a time that it was just near impossible to get through to the doctor's surgery. That was because the inundated numbers of people that were calling us, OK, um, to be able to, to do that. And indeed, in August, uh, we uh, were able to extend our telephone system, OK, to be increase the capacity. Um, and it, it did take us a good few months, but that was purely due to COVID and being able to actually um, update our technology, up, extend our services to be able to do that. And I hope now that actually the ability to phone the surgery has improved. Um, now, if we look at our other areas, you can see that we've still been visiting people at home. Um, we've been still issuing prescriptions and delivering those services. And indeed, our blood tests and results associated with investigations, having consulted with patients, um, are above 10,000. So again, over ev ev averagely, every person has had at least one test um, in the last six months or seven months, should I say. Um, I'd like to kind of touch upon Durrington because I understand that actually to close Durrington to the to the patient population who used that um, was a was a very uh, major and uh, a decision that was not taken lightly um, about how to continue services for our population. And I appreciate the inconvenience that that um, at times caused, continues to cause. Um, so from just to recap for those that didn't um, haven't perhaps known about Durrington surgery is that at the end of March, we took the, the decision to close um, to patients to be able to walk in. OK, and for a short while well, until uh, September, the surgery was closed for appointments um, completely and everybody that needed to be seen face to face were invited to come to Uphaven surgery. The reason for that is that we were able to house all of our clinicians um, maintaining social distancing, being COVID secure and therefore being able to answer your queries, deal with the consultations um, that were coming in as quickly and effectively as possible. Um, we didn't. Um, meanwhile, we focused our frontline staff who were seeing patients in Uphaven um, and of course, those of you who've been to Uphaven, you know that we are restricted to five rooms um, and we needed to ensure that people came to one site to prevent a loss of workforce, which would ultimately mean a loss of healthcare provision to the population um, that that we supply and we couldn't take that risk. So for that level of inconvenience that I understand, I hope that you'll see that we actually were able to continue delivering services when the chips were down, when you know things were not working well. We didn't have screens to protect us. We didn't necessarily have enough PPE um, to protect both you and our clinicians to keep working and keep delivering services throughout this difficult time. Um, so consequently, we never stopped delivering any services at all. You could still get your smear, um, get a smear test. You could still get your blood test. Now, I do understand that some of you have kind of received, you know, or experienced delays um, with uh, obtaining uh, services from other um, organisations, such as the hospitals um, locally around us. Now, again, that is unfortunately beyond our control, but I do know that they try their very best to have um, kept their services going to um, optimise their capacity to see you. Um, I understand that sometimes these can't, these things can't be helped, but they do inform us um, if if there is a problem, and we do try and keep connected um, with our our local secondary care providers um, to be able to do that. We've had other changes made to Uphaven, and that was because the new guidance out means that we have to have a separate exit for everybody who's entering the building. So we've been able to um, change a, a window into a door in Uphaven. 
so that actually patients don't go back through the waiting room and back through the normal entrance having seen um, a clinician here. OK, now, unfortunately, that's not possible in Durrington, hence why we haven't just opened the doors to allow people to walk in and out because we are um, restricted to one a one way access um, system into the building. That means that at the moment, although you book appointments to come in, the clinician will meet you at the door, um, take you through to the your consulting room and see you out. So um, although that's perhaps not as convenient to collect things, which um, obviously hopefully PharmaSelf will, will address um, to be able to do that, it does mean that you do get that personal service, that the COVID screening happens at the door um, and that we keep the service as safe as possible and maintained for all of you um, throughout this kind of challenging pandemic that at the moment we can't quite see the, the end of just yet. So um, we've got all these going on and I think another point that we need to make in terms of all of these things is about the appointment length because we, despite the, the numbers, despite our efforts to try and do that, I think there needs to be a, um, an acknowledgement from us as a practice um, towards you guys is that actually the appointments um, are double in length to what they were before. So although you may still experience a 10 minute appointment, we have to allocate 20 minutes to ensure that the clinicians can um, put on PPE, um, see you, take off PPE, clean the rooms and get them ready for the next patient. And so um, our actual capacity on a day to day basis has reduced purely from the point of view of needing to do all of those extra things that previous to COVID we didn't need to do. So I just kind of wanted you to understand that really and to give that other side of what's what's happening. Um, coupled with all these things, of course, as I said at the very beginning, um, government announcements um, in and out and all over the place can can be challenging to keep up with, um, can guide people in the in the in the wrong ways um, to be able to do that. And I think that that will be apparent with the vaccine, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But I just hope that I've kind of given an overview and I would like to thank you all um, for your um, efforts to keep patient with us, um, to keep smiling, um, to know that we are we are here. But as there's the first question that was posed this evening was about what can you do to help us through this winter? And that is to use us when you need us, but not to use us when you don't. When you can go to a pharmacy, go to a pharmacy to obtain care. OK, when you can um, when you can take those those tablets, the, the paracetamol, because you've got a sore throat. OK, we ask you to take self care measures first before contacting us on the first occasion. OK, now I, I take that in jest and I don't like to talk about the things that some people um, contact us about. OK, but it is a reality. All right. We need to be used to deliver medical care. OK, we have patients that call us because their supermarket delivery hasn't arrived yet. OK, we have think about what to do because somebody has um, received some minor sun sunburn, has had a headache for an hour. Now, I know that that might sound kind of various and, and different and, and absurd to some and, and normal to others. But I think having that self care directive to think about what you can do first would be a brilliant um, kind of contribution to the NHS um, to be able to do that so that when you call us, we know that that's what you need. OK, and we will we will be there for you, uh, but we need to optimise our capacity. We need to make sure that we um, only use the clinicians for for their expertise um, to be able to do that. And remember that in terms of well-being, mental well-being in particular, OK, although you may not see the doctor, although you may not see a nurse practitioner, OK, Claire is here, Nick is here, OK, and we can offer those supports to you um, to guide you through that because we understand that of all these things during this period of time, actually our mental health is, is suffering. It's been a long time now um, and there doesn't seem to be a way forward just yet. So I'm going to move on to the next bit, though, in terms of what happens for 2020 and beyond. OK, so as I've just said, I really want us to work together about how we can optimise the NHS. OK, self-care measures are the are the way forward and to be able to do that and asking your pharmacy is a good option as well. Now, I understand patients who are dispensing with us don't have the pharmacy option, so just concentrating on self-care would be brilliant. 
because importantly for the rest of 2020 and 2021 we need to focus um, on the need to look at um, the COVID vaccination programme um, to be able to do that um, and also in terms of other initiatives that are going on within the NHS to try and move us forward in light of the pandemic. So we will have the balancing act of making sure that our services are accessible, that they're delivered timely to you, but also balance out your, the need for extensive knowledge, for understanding and importantly continuity of care. And that's what is core to general practice. That's what's core to your doctor's surgery is that we have an established sustainable workforce that see you on a regular basis. OK, um, we have been we have grown all together. We understand the highs and lows and we can work together to work that forward. So listening, that is both that we listen to you and you listen to us. And that that is a recipe for success, dare I say it in such a cheesy way. And we should move forward for that. So for us in Avon Valley, OK, we want to um, make sure that Farmer South is embedded. We'll continue with our ways of of working at present um, under the new current guidelines that NHS England uh, promote in terms of t speaking with somebody first before having an appointment. OK, apart from those, obviously, that are clearly um, for procedures that we can't deal with over the telephone. OK, and we'll decide what we need to do in 2021 with where that world is going to take us. And I'm going to stop there in, in terms of, of COVID-19 um, at that at that point, um, because I think um, so COVID-19 with vaccines, because that's another element. But what I would like to move on to is what's happening in the wider um, aspects and the wider system of the of the NHS. OK, and I'll ask, answer your questions in a second because I think it's relevant. OK, so I don't know if anybody's heard of NHS 111 first. However, it is coming and it's coming to us in December. OK, so this is coming in response to COVID and uh, what they've found is that actually um, secondary care trusts so, um, accident and emergency cannot just have open doors OK, for people to to walk in. They do not. They are not COVID secure to the level of what is needed to guide us through the rest of the pandemic and beyond. So what's going to be launched in December um, by Salisbury Hospital um, is um, NHS 1114 first and the slogan is talk before you walk and what they'll be asking all of us to do is to phone 111 before you think you need to go to the hospital to sit in accident and emergency. So of course this doesn't take away from 999 that remains if there is an emergency you call 999. However, for those things where you think mm, should I should I go as as the hospital will say it's it's minor OK, it's what the NHS are going to ask you to do is to phone 111 and they will um, talk you through numerous questions and they will book you an appointment if it's the appropriate place for you to go to. And that is A&E. If it's not, if it's Salisbury Walking Centre, OK, they'll advise you to go there. If they think it's your GP practice, they'll advise you to go there. But the slogan going forward will be talk before you walk. OK, so I just wanted to give you some heads up about that. Um, I know it only seems weeks away. Things are moving very fast in the NHS. Um, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you some heads up that that is coming. There will be um, local regional um, press about um, NHS 111 first. Um, you will be guided through that. But I thought this was just a great opportunity to uh, bring this to your attention. OK. So before I move on to um, COVID-19 vaccines, OK, I'd just like to kind of have a look at these questions and see if there's any that I can um, answer um, as we as we go. So um, I'm just going to start at the top here and just check. So there's a question here about um, as follows. When will the flu vaccine be available to the under 65s? OK, so I assume you're therefore asking about who will be vaccinated to the 50 to 64 year olds who are not currently in the clinical risk group to have a flu vaccine. Um, we have been given guidelines at the moment to ensure that all of our patients who are clinically at risk or age, over the age of 65 are to be vaccinated um, first. 
Now, we haven't been given a directive as yet, and we've been told not to vaccinate people aged 50 to 64 until NHS England give that instruction. And to date, they haven't done that. OK, we will be looking to support that programme. But until we hear more, until we know when we are being advised to do that, we need to sit and, and wait. If somebody, though, uh, requires a vaccine before that, that does not want to wait, there are ph um, pharmacies delivering medications um, for a cost, uh, for a vaccination for a cost. Um, I can't call offhand um, how much that is, um, but there are those services available should you require it sooner than that. I'm sorry not to be able to answer any any clearer um, to be able to do that. Now, there are some questions about COVID vaccine, which I'll ask in a bit um, to be able to do that. So I'm just moving through. Um, so there's again a question about in terms of why uh, flu vaccines were delivered predominantly from Durrington surgery, not um, Uphaven surgery. The reason being is that we could um, see a lot more patients through um, this, the, uh, the time frame at Durrington. We could see up to six patients at a time um, being COVID secure, um, keeping time minimum in the practice to be able to do that and maintain our normal services at Uphaven. Now, I do appreciate that our nursing capacity um, was, was slightly diminished during the flu, the, the major part of the flu campaign um, to be able to do that. Um, however, we did maintain our other services as best we could um, to make sure that we could offer as many services as possible and um, without disrupting normal care. Now, um, the other important part of that is that we did offer um, a Paven um, pay, uh, vaccinations as frequently as we could whilst maintaining that same day care for everybody moving through. So I'm just going to go through to between that. So we've got um, can you please explain why the telephone never appears to be answered between one and three? It just rings and rings, which is most frustrating. OK, now what I'm going to do is run some reports. I'm going to find out where the peaks and troughs are and we'll adapt our workforce accordingly. OK, so I will. Um, I understand your experience. I will investigate that and I will bring that into the summary. OK. Um, OK, the next question, how do I change to this from my local pharmacy? So in terms of that, I'm assuming that you're talking about farm self. Uh, good question. Really good. If you are a dispensing practice, you uh, sorry, if you are a dispensing patient, you collect your medicines from us. You will be able to use that machine. Um, you just need to let us know. OK, and we will change your settings and that will get set um, automatically. If you are a non dispensing patient, OK, um, we have offered the use of our farm self machine to other pharmacies locally, they have indeed turned us down, apart from Serum Pharmacy. So if you use Serum Pharmacy, you will be able to collect your medicine from the PharmaSelf unit coming in. And you can change your um, local pharmacy online using your online um, uh, account, um, or you can um, let us know when you next order and just put a note on the, um, on the prescription request. OK, so the other question is, um, and uh, Dr Green, this is one for, for you. So it changed me from talking all the time. So Dr Green, whilst face to face appointments will always be necessary in some circum in some instances, do you envisage that post COVID you will provide more telephone appointments? It seems to work well. well that's a very interesting question. Um, telephone appointments are useful um, in certain situations. It, it's difficult to tell depending on how much information is given by the patient, whether in fact a phone call is going to be adequate or not. So at the moment we are doing phone calls and quite often they're perfectly adequate, at least to initiate a consultation, decide what needs to be done and maybe need to see someone face to face once rather than previously seeing people a couple of times. Um, I think telephone calls for, from our point of view are good but we don't always get people answering straight away there's a lot more wasted time from our side of things phoning people two or three times and then we end up speaking to someone and they've had a five minute phone call but from our point of view we probably wasted five minutes getting there and when we put the phone down we still have a couple of minutes of work to do so you don't see the whole time that that takes us um, and when we see people face to face I think it's more efficient so I think we will do more phone calls, um, but I'm hoping that we can get back to doing really more face-to-face -face as well. We'll try and get the balance right. 
Hi, thanks, Dr. Green. OK, so that's a, that's a good question. I was just about to um, ask uh, Nina to answer one about um, a farm herself um, to be able to do that, but she seems to have um, had to, to disappear for a little bit. So I'm going to hold that question and we'll come to that at the at the end. Um, I think I've answered all the questions that have been raised so far. Oh, hang on. No, oh, hang on. Nina is just coming back. So let me just answer this, um, ask her this question. So Nina, another question on farm staff. Do you have enough boxes for medication? Should there be delays in collection of prescriptions or should you have an, or should you have an unusually high request for medications on a particular day? Um, yes, we should have enough um, collect boxes for collection. What we're hoping to do is put the medication into the boxes for a number of days. So you'll have a number of days to collect your medication and we're going to tweak that as we go along. So we try and error at first, but yeah, there should be enough boxes for everybody to collect the medication. Thanks, Nina. Yeah, so we've been guided by PharmaSelf to uh, recommend a five day window at the present time. So that's what we will start with. OK, um, having um, adv been advised by the manufacturer that um, that's a good place to start um, and then we'll um, we'll amend it accordingly. OK, to be able to do that. Um, now, there is another question posed about um, the uh, being is um, isolated or being asked to shield, um, not then being eligible for a flu vaccine and whether or not that they will be able to um, have a COVID vaccine. So I'm just going to move that on in terms of COVID. In terms of the flu flu jabs, um, there are set national criteria about who should have a um, a flu jab, and uh, without knowing your history and talking with you, that's really difficult to. Uh, that's a very personal um, kind of situation and one that I can't answer here. However, um, we will take that up, and I will try and contact you afterwards um, to be able to deal with that perhaps tomorrow. Okay, so I'm just now going to move on to the um, COVID-19 vaccination program. Now, there has been a huge amount in the press, some of it true, some of it not, okay? Now, it's very, very tricky. The reason being is that actually the information was leaked and wasn't shared with any of us. And although uh, that's helpful in some respects, in other ways it isn't. So everything is on the back foot. Um, and I'm just going to move my notes here to make sure that I do actually cover everything because it's so fresh and new in my mind at the moment. Now, importantly, what I'm going to share with you today is the facts, the things that we do know currently right now. I can't say that I can answer any que every question. I don't know that yet, but all I do know is that we're trying our very best to make sure this is going to work as efficiently, as effectively as we can from the outset. So to recap, you will be required to have two vaccinations. OK, they will either be three weeks apart or four weeks apart. We don't know which yet. I was told three weeks on one um, on Tuesday oh no, four weeks on Tuesday, three weeks today. So we do know that there are two and we do know that there's a period of, um, of uh, well, there's a gap between them, either three weeks, either four. So we do know that. We also know that they need to be stored at between minus 70 and minus 80 degrees. So what the plan currently is, is that they will be stored at Salisbury Hospital and they will be transported to us in batches of 975 in a, in a basically in a pizza box. OK, they're going to be delivered to us and we have to use them within five to seven days. Sometimes it's seven days, sometimes it's five. So we'll have to get clarity on how long it actually is, but they are safe to put into our clinical examination um, and our clinical fridges, OK, and used within five or seven days, OK, to be able to do that. So we do not need to store them at minus 70 to minus 80 degrees. That makes this a lot more viable about how we're going to be able to deliver this vaccine to you. Now, we have been told that the um, the, the government will set up a national call and recall system. That means that patients who are um, required to have the vaccine well, are going to be offered the vaccine first is going to be dictated by the government. OK, and they will send those people a letter and they will advise those patients that they can either book an appointment 
at a what's being called a mass vaccination centre, OK, or they can book an appointment with their GP surgery. Importantly, wherever you have your first um, vaccination, you will have to go back to to have your second vaccination. OK, you can't switch between a mass vaccination centre and a GP surgery. OK, it will have to be one or the other. You'll book those appointments. OK, now in the cohort one, that's what we've been told so far. OK, the latest news is that the first patients to get a vaccine, I will say the first people to get the vaccine will be patients over 80 who live in their own homes. OK, and um, anybody who lives in a residential care home. It will also extend to health and social care workers as well. Now, to put that in perspective, OK, for our practice, that's just over um, three, 350 patients in total. OK, so we we have that number in our first cohort. Now, we are not um, we have to work, sorry, with um, other practices in the local area. OK, and we don't do that as part of what's called our primary care network that we're already established in. And we work in our primary care network with um, a local well, two local practices, which are Serum Health Group, which are Millstream Medical Centre that's based in Salisbury and Salisbury Plain Health Centre, which is based at Lark Hill. Now, we will need to deliver these vaccinations um, at that level. So we will need to work with the other practice to deliver this programme to you. Now, in total, um, across the two practices, there are 775 patients that are in cohort one. That means we need one box of these 975 vaccines that are going to be delivered to us to be able to deliver those vaccines to you. We do not know when they're coming. We don't know what is happening with that, but we are pushing for a Wiltshire wide model to be able to um, vaccinate people that are housebound. OK, the reason for that is to maintain that cold chain throughout because we do not want anything to jeopardise the quality, the integrity of that vaccination. So that's what we are looking to to do. OK, we'll look to to do that and we're actually going to run it in a very similar way to how we run the flu vaccination clinics, whereby people will be invited in groups of six. They will move through and watch a video. They will go through and sit with a clinician who will um, vaccinate you in the, in the premises and you will be asked to wait for 15 minutes um, to uh, because of the reaction to the to the vaccination. OK, there will be a GP on site who will be available should any medical emergency occur um, and, and then you're free to go. Now, we are required by um, NHS England to only use one site. We are only allowed to, to, to use one site to deliver the COVID vaccination programme. To ensure that we have a sufficient space, keep COVID secure, um, provide you with enough parking um, to give enough sufficient supplies to the staff. Our option is to use um, Salisbury Plain Health Centre, which is a brand new building in Lark Hill. OK, it has the, the waiting room, to put this in perspective, um, pre-COVID held 120 people. OK, so we can easily get through having um, a map, you know, up to 40 people in the waiting room safely maintaining social distancing, seeing people through and into the consulting rooms. We also have enough holding space to keep people up to 18 at a time, waiting for 15 minutes before leaving, whilst also maintaining social distancing. OK, this is absolutely imperative. The car parking is free. OK, There's a, there is a lot of car parking, so there won't be any hold ups with that. Um, and it means that we can optimise what we deliver and when we deliver it. Um, and in essence, we'll do it as very much as we can to keep it on Saturdays to ensure that you can continue delivering normal services as we would normally deliver Monday to Friday. Um, now, doing the maths at a, a, um, a vaccination delivery of 975, which is the minimum that they are um, guaranteeing to us, uh, we have 14,000 people to vaccinate. So if we do all the vaccinations, OK, that's going to take us 28 weeks. OK, so that takes us to June. Now, um, we are looking at how we best do this. We want you to use us. We know that we're local. We want that environmental footprint 
um, being as minimal as it can be. But we understand that mass vaccination centres are a must to get through these numbers, to get through to everybody whilst we maintain services for all the other healthcare needs that you have. Um, but it's going to be a good experience with us. Those of you that um, have come to Derrington and had your flu vaccination, OK, you you saw the the kind of the camaraderie, the elements that we're in this together. And actually, this is an opportunity again for us to do that and we'll do it to the best of our ability. OK, and we will see and vaccinate as many people as we can, as quickly as we can, whilst also maintaining all those other services that are crucial to your healthcare, not just during this pandemic about COVID, but about every other healthcare condition that you are experiencing. So um, I'd like to just kind of end on that note to be able to ask any more questions, answer any more questions about that um, on that on that front. So this is where I think um, somebody said about, let me just have a look. Oh, sorry, I just moved on the questions um, in terms of these things of looking through. Um, when you're likely to be called? OK, so that's a really good question. So of course I explained about cohort one being over 80s, people that live in residential care homes and um, health, health and social care workers. OK, we understand that the um, the next cohort of people will be 75 to 80 and so it will go through. Uh, so the, the offer will go to people in in age order in five year groups. So it will go from 75 to 80, 70 to 75, 65 to 70 and so on. We are aware that there are people that are aged 18 to um, to to 50 um, who have who are at medium risk and those that are at high risk. We are still awaiting clarity on what prioritisation those people will have. But this um, order will be set by the government. It won't be set by the GP practice and we will be required to honour that. So I hope I've answered that that one. Um, I've got a question here. Will you and practice staff trust the vaccine in, enough to have it yourselves? It will be offered to everybody. Like I've said, it's a personal decision for every single person in this country um, and we have to trust the processes of how that vaccination is stored. Um, Dr Green, is there anything else that you want to add about that? So just to recap on the question for you, will you and practice staff trust the vaccine enough to have it yourselves? As you say, that's an individual decision. As far as I'm concerned, I will have it, but I can't comment for anybody else. But I think uh, it, it will be, um, you know, the cold chain will be kept too. So we know the vaccine will be as safe as it can be. Um, and certainly I think we're a vulnerable group because we are meeting lots of people. We need to protect ourselves to protect you. So personally, yes. Thanks, Dr Green. OK, so um, I hope that's answered uh, that question for you. I think just to recap on the location of where you'll be able to obtain your vaccine, I understand that it's a drive away Lark Hill, but it's not that far. And um, I think the reasons for keeping it on one site is about maintaining that cold chain, about maintaining the integrity of that vaccination. And I think that is why the government are insisting that we have one um, point of of delivery um, for groups of practices to work within. And that will be the case for everywhere in this in this area. Everybody will have to nominate set sites to be able to deliver that that vaccination from. OK, so it won't be Uphaven and it won't be Durrington and it won't be Salisbury. It will be Lark Hill. But I hope that that experience will be a very positive one for you and one where you feel very safe um, and one where you know that you will receive the care in the best way forward. How will I know when I'm due to be vaccinated? OK, so that is that you're going to receive a letter from the government. OK, you will receive a letter from the government that will explain to you that you can book an appointment at what's being called a mass vaccination centre um, or you can book an appointment with your GP surgery. So Lark Hill is challenging for people with mobility issues. Is it worth letting people know? Um, now, Lark Hill is a brand new building. Um, it is uh, what we would call DDA compliant. Um, it has full access um, in terms of ramps, slopes, and it's a huge building. Um, so actually, in terms of mobility, um, if you need support, we will offer that. Um, we have wheelchairs available accordingly and is to let us know that if there's any support that we can offer um, then to let us know when you're booking the appointment. Um, now I've got another question here. Uh, 
It says, my wife is classified as clinically at high risk, as is my mum, who is aged 88 and lives with us. Will I therefore be given the COVID vaccine at the same time as my wife and mum to further protect them? As far as I'm aware, I don't think they'll be entitled to it. But if you have any more up to date information, if it is purely going to be based on individual clinical need and we're not taking households into account, uh, then I think they'll have to wait until their turn comes. But if you've got any any other information, Anna, please update. Hi, yeah, absolutely. I, I have to say I agree with Dr Green at the moment. The current guidelines are that it is those that are clinically at risk, not those that, who live with somebody who's clinically at risk. Um, so that's what the current guidelines are to be able to, to do that. Um, now, well, just going through the questions, um, um, I've got one for Nina um, that poses um, that uh, can people, people that don't want to collect their medication from um, PharmaSelf, can they collect it from Durrington still? Um, yes, uh, um, we need to work out um, what we're going to be doing with regards to medication because obviously it is still closed door at Durrington, but we will, st we will still be able to let you collect your medication. So if it doesn't go into the machine, there'll be um, something put in place so that you can collect your medication from Durrington surgery or indeed a pavement surgery. But we will keep you updated as what what we're going to do. Thanks, Nina. OK, so let me just have a look down some more questions. Oh, OK, so uh, let me have a look. What will be the catchment? Um, so. So, OK, here's a question. Um, Dr Green, is the vaccine safe if you might have already had COVID? Um, I guess it is. I mean, we do vaccinate people who've had um, previous infections. Uh, so the, the shingles vaccine, we vaccinate people who may have had shingles in the past. Um, if you've already been exposed to the virus, then you won't be being exposed to it for the first time. You might get a slightly more uh, localised response. So I guess that you might find that the, the vaccination site might be a little bit sore than if you've not been exposed to it. Um, that's really just off the top of my head. It won't cause any major issues. Um, it will just boost your immunity. Thanks, Dr Green. OK, um, so there's another question posed. What will the catchment area for Lark Hill actually be? What's the population size we're looking at for local delivery if vaccine? If vaccine? This will obviously impact on how long the process will take. Now, as I said at the beginning, in total, we do have 14,000 people of which we do need to vaccinate. However, when we're looking through the list, actually um, 8,000 of those are of the, um, no, sorry, 7,500 are 18 to 50 without any clinical risk factors. So actually that number could be considered to actually be just below 7,000. Now on that case, bearing in mind what we can deliver, if the government cap us at 975 a week, it is going to take time. We don't know that situation at the moment because we don't know the availability of this vaccine into the UK in the first place. So the important thing here is that is that for us, we will deliver as much as we can as quickly as we can do that. And indeed for our area, actually our population is one of the smallest ones. So you're looking at other areas that have got say, I mean, more people than that um, to be able to vaccinate in exactly the same time frame. So we are small but beautiful is how I would describe us. Um, OK, and we will deliver as quickly as we can, but we will not jeopardise services Monday to Friday. OK, we cannot let you not be seen during the week because you need a COVID vaccine. We need to balance the two. And I think it goes back to that um, slide that I showed you about the weighing scales. OK, we need to balance um, those things out to ensure that we deliver a holistic care to you. I know that that's tricky. I, it, it's difficult and we're in a pandemic. OK, and we will do everything that we can do. And I think that that's what we can reassure you of. We will try our very, very best. Um, so uh, I hope I've answered that question. We've now got another one and it says, um, and this one's for you, Nina. I'm afraid I missed your information on the new machine. Is there information on the website? Um, there isn't information on the website as yet, um, but there will be information um, in the next couple of days um, to give you um, an, an insight of what was discussed today and moving forward when the machine's in place um, next Wednesday. 
Thanks, Nina. OK, so yeah, just to really recap on that, absolutely, we'll share that information. Um, uh, but in terms of what we're doing, I it's the same as last year. And um, the person that's posed this question was at our meetings last last year. I'm absolutely sure if I remember the name correctly. Um, and uh, and it's it is that ATM for medicine. OK, so rather than put your pin number in and get cash out, you're going to put your num pin your number in and get medication out. Um, if you pay for your medication, you'll be asked to um, use your card to pay. If you um, are exempt, then you'll be asked to give the reason for your exemption and then you'll be given your medicine free of charge. OK, now that does rely on uh, trust. It does rely on people ticking and make a kind of declaring an exemption that is true, but that's not for us to police. OK, what's called the prescription pricing authority will do that and they will check uh, people's submissions to ensure that they are um, not fraudulent. They are correct. Um, for that, but we will set um, more information on our website. Uh, we'll we'll share the videos that we um, uh, showed to everybody earlier, um, and we'll give a summary of what we're doing. But actually, this is a big thing for Avon Valley practice. It's a very big thing um, for the staff, and I think it's an even bigger thing for all our po patient population who are going to benefit from this. So we will keep you updated, and um, we will keep kind of helping to encourage uh, you to to use the machine. And indeed, if anybody wants to volunteer as a kind of champion to help, perhaps show, show people how to use the machine in the early days. Um, get in touch with Nina because that would be brilliant. OK, so I'm just going through some more questions. So uh, here's a question. How many vaccines will you be able to deliver per week from Lark Hill? So as I explained about the COVID vaccine, they are coming in boxes of 975. We have only been told that at minimum we will receive 975. They will not give us any more information than that, and we do need to use them within the week. So we have to deliver 975 vaccines a week. OK, that's what we've got at the moment and that's what we're working with. Um, so then there's another question here um, in terms of that. Will smear tests be available in the coming months? Uh, now, indeed, we've had smear tests um, or smear appointments available throughout the time. Indeed, we were contacting patients um, and indeed even myself was sat trying to encourage patients to book appointments, sending text messages out saying, please, 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 Book your smear, book your smear. Um, and because of obviously the situation, because people were, were worried about things, we totally understand, but didn't book those appointments. However, as things kind of started to go back to a new normal of whatever new normal is, OK, more people wanted to um, have their smear test. And of course, we are capped at a certain level of appointments um, and therefore we're trying our best. We have appointments available um, to be able to do that as the nursing appointments become available. Um, but we will be looking at doing some catch up slots in January and February. However, um, and that's probably doing it at weekends. However, that had been organised pre the COVID vaccination launch and um, whether or not we will have sufficient staff to be able to offer Saturday clinics um, uh, in January and February, I, I don't know, um, but I do know that the nursing appointments are becoming more and more available now that flu has um, been achieved um, and that uh, we are kind of continuing to learn and increase our capacity in terms of what we can deliver and when. So, OK, we've got another question. Is the 90, 975 set by the government just up over in Durrington or the others involved in Lark Hill as well? Yes, it is capped for our group. Now, we are fortunate. I can't give you the exact numbers of other groups of practices that work together. I do know that um, Barcroft um, Medical um, Centre, St Mella Surgery and Castle practices in Lugger and Tidworth work together. They were last counted at, I think, 37,500 people. They were working one group together. We work in our group at just under 20,000 with Serum Health Group, but that number is set at 975, regardless of how big you are. That is the current guidance that we have. Uh, just before we move on to a, a doctor question, we have got um, somebody else say, sorry, I missed when the machine will be available for use. So Nina, do you just want to recap on when the machine's going to be available? That's the farmer self. So the, the machine is being installed on Wednesday of next week and staff will be receiving training on Wednesday of next week. Um, so 
as soon as we have got used to the machine, we are going to let our patients know by um, updating the website and sending out an SMS message to when the machine will be up and running. But we're hoping to get it up and running um, as soon as possible because obviously we want everybody to be able to use it. But we will keep you updated. We just need to make sure that um, all staff know how to use the machine properly. Hi, thank you for that, Nina. OK, so um, we've got a question here, um, Dr Green. Could you talk about online consultations where you can see the doctor and the doctor can see us as opposed to telephone consultations? Is this an option if we want it? And if so, how can we indicate that that's the way we'd like to go in a particular case? So that's our video consultations that some people refer to um, to be able to look at. So Dr Green, can you give us an answer on that one? So. Um... Initially, video consultation start as a telephone consultation and uh, and then we can use something called AccuRx, which uh, can send you a message on your mobile phone to initiate a video consultation. Um, and then we can do a face to face sort of video consultation. You can see us, we can see you um, and it doesn't involve uh, MS Teams or Zoom or anything like that. It is basically done through your mobile phone. Um, that can be useful for some people uh, seeing them. You can sometimes be able to assess how difficult they are breathing potentially. Um, for patients who might have COVID, so have either had a cough or a temperature, who we really don't want to be seeing face to face, then a video consultation is a, a second best way of at least seeing how, how breathless they are and whether they're struggling to breathe or not. Um, and beyond that, we can use the home testing kit that they can collect from the surgery to potentially check blood pressures and oxygen sats at home. But a video consultation that starts as a telephone consultation and then becomes a video just so we can see people uh, probably isn't worth it. Rashes, I have to say, are very difficult to assess because the quality of the imaging isn't very, very defined. The, the definition isn't great. Um, so if we're looking to assess a mole or a rash that someone has, if they can, if we can do a video consultation, it, it may not be good enough unless it's a blindingly obvious shingles or something like that. Uh, otherwise, we would probably prefer to see people face to face or get a very good still image of what it is they want us to see. Um, but quite often the images that we're being sent are not in focus. So video consultations are useful in some situations, but they aren't an answer to everything. So um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of sort of rolling them out as being a more uh, common thing to do, as you saw from the statistics earlier. We've only done about 100 video consultations and I think we very quickly realised their limitations. So um, that's why we don't tend to do too many of them. But uh, there's still an option for us. So I was just saying thank you to Dr Green and appreciating that actually from that medical side, that video consultations are not always um, optimal and there are other ways of which we can deliver care. However, Claire and Nick, and actually did use video consultations quite a lot for the talking aspects of our consultations, whereby, you know, having to physically um, look at, say, a rash or something is not relevant to their jobs to be able to do that. So I'm just going to pass over to Claire to kind of explain how video consultations work uh, when discussing mental well-being. Okay, okay so um, video consultations are really beneficial when we can't have somebody in the practice. Um, it just gives us an opportunity to mimic the face to face. Um, we are able to communicate. I can see exactly what's happening with a patient and it, it gives us more of a, a way of communicating rather than telephone appointments where it's not as personal. Um, I'm able to communicate better and build that relationship with the patient a lot easier than it is via the telephone. Um, so they're really useful to um, the wellbeing team and um, being able to create the environment that would be in the surgery itself. Thanks, Claire. Much appreciated. Nick, is there anything that you want to add about video consultations or the consultations in which you provide care? I think um, we, we also offer just a telephone call as well, which um, is suitable for some people if you don't have video facilities. but um, 
it is generally um, your choice if you'd like to have video telephone um, appointments. Thank you. Thanks, Nick, for that too. OK, so hopefully we've answered that that question. Um, now, there's two things. One is that um, somebody said it's pleasing to hear more of nursing appointments are, are to become available. Can you advise as and to when this will happen? Indeed, we've increased our nursing capacity already. Um, we have various different shifts. I think the feeling is that they get booked so quickly that as much as we put more appointments on the system, it's as quickly as they are, they are taken. Uh, we keep monitoring that and we keep um, amending and changing what we're doing to try our best to increase our capacity. So there are more appointments available now that's already happened um, to be able to, to do that. Um, also remember that we are going to a period whereby uh, initially perhaps some staff's leave was cancelled because of COVID. We're getting to the point eight months in where actually people do need a rest um, and we do have to balance the well-being of our workforce to continue this sustained um, pressure um, going forward. So um, I think that's, that was particularly the case in, in September where we had more stuff off, not due to ill health, but due to the need to having um, a break from, from services um, to be able to do that because we are in this for the long haul. We, we aim not to let you down, to not reduce our capacity to a point that is unsafe um, but we do need to enable our workforce to to rest as well and especially with this vaccination program whereby indeed I've got a question here asking when it's going to start it looks like we've been told it's going to happen in December um, however nothing more than that so honestly when we find out and we know we will share that with you we will update you i think that that's a really important part and i'd quite like to hold these meetings um, about the covid vaccination program as we know more so that we have a a, a dialogue directly um, saves you having to try and contact us and send us messages through um, our website by asking questions perhaps at consultations about what you can do what i think would be a very um, proactive way of working through the next few months in light of this program is to hold such meetings as we are, as we are now um, so that we can actually answer your queries and explain what is happening um, face to face as much as we can obviously using uh, the digital world um, so um, I hope I've answered that um, question um, in terms of vaccination. Um, somebody else has asked, can they still get a flu jab? Yes, they can. Contact us. Um, so, um, and uh, we've had lots of um, thank yous, which is lovely to read, and our staff will be very, very appreciative um, of your comments, and we really do appreciate that. Um, first one being in terms of one, because we've got five minutes to go until the end, which is my family have just moved back to Derrington and need to register, sorry, re-register. As there are no receptions in at the moment, will there be a delay in us being registered? The short answer is no, there is no delay. OK, we have always registered uh, people in our hub in Uphaven. That is no different now to what it was before. So please be assured we are we are there. We're still working and we haven't made any delays at all. We haven't encountered any, should I say? That's probably better English uh, to be able to do that. OK, so yes, no delays. Register with us um, and um, and the sooner you can do that with all the information that includes your ID, the better and more um, efficient we can be. Um, OK, so I've, uh, there's one more uh, one more question that I missed that's up above. Dr Green, OK, what does the COVID vaccine comprise of and are there different types of vaccine? <laughs> oh dear, I don't know any more than anyone else has heard on the BBC. So yeah, <laughs> I believe we're developing vaccines to protein S on the spike, if you believe the BBC, and all vaccines are developed in the same way. So presumably we'll have similar efficacy. Um, but yeah, we don't have any more information than anyone else as far as I'm aware. Thank you, absolutely. Um, I haven't heard any other information about that either in all the uh, literature that's been sent to us. So um, I'm just gonna take another look at the, the questions um, and, uh, and hope 
that uh, indeed I have answered all your questions. I very much like the uh, end comments. I'll read out Anna. Many thanks to you and the team for a very frank and informative session. I found it very valuable and very impressive. Well, thank you. It's our first one. Um, we have to try these things. We have to work out what's what. OK, and uh, thank you for any patience whereby things haven't worked quite well when we've been talking without our mics on. Um, to be able to, to do that um, and where there's been slight delays in transfer with our producer um, trying to work out who's going to speak when um, and who's who should be on camera. Um, so I'm going to finish up there. I'm just going to give a final thanks where the cameras are going to move to each speaker just to say kind of goodbye, good night. Um, again, we really, really appreciate your support. Um, use us wisely. And that's the message that we have for you um, today in terms of that. And enjoy Farm Yourself. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, thanks guys. guys. Have a good evening. Thanks for joining. Bye. Yeah, thank you all for joining. It's very difficult and odd here because I've got no idea how many people are actually looking at the moment. It's a very strange experience, but um, hopefully there are people out there, so thank you. Ah, OK, so just on that note, in total, we had 55 people with us this evening. OK, that is absolutely fantastic. And um, so again, very good numbers. We usually have people turning up to us on our annual face to face meetings of between eight and ten. So to reach 55 of you is is brilliant. So again, thank you for your time this evening. OK, we will meet again. Um, I promise that we'll hold another COVID vaccination meeting, even if it's just 20 minutes to say we actually don't know anything more um, or whatever, but um, bear with us. No news in some respects is good news currently when the world is changing very, very quickly. OK, so thank you so much. Thanks for your patience and, uh, and thanks for attending. Good night.